Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, nice uh, conference. And uh, my talk is 30 minutes. So I'm going to uh, focus on a specific topic, which is uh, related to the formation of primordial black holes. And my talk is based on my recent paper, which I write in this slide. So if you find my talk interesting, please also have a look at this paper. So primordial black holes, which is a topic of my talk. So primordial black holes are black holes that are formed in the very, very early universe. And they are quite different from the astrophysical black holes, which were formed by the gravitational collapse of the of, uh, stars, heavy stars. And uh, there has been a, a renewed interest in primordial black holes recently, triggered by the discovery of uh, binary black holes by LIGO and VAGO. And, uh, and by this detection, an interesting possibility arises that the black, uh, LIGO black holes are all of LIGO black holes were some of the some of them uh, are primordial black holes, and in addition to this, uh, there are at least uh, two uh, uh, motivations to study primordial black holes. One is that uh, primordial black holes, in some mass range, can comprise all dark matter. Uh, uh, black holes only interact uh, gravitationally with uh, other particles, so black holes have only have only weak interactions with. Uh, with other particles, and uh, black holes are non-relativistic behaves as uh, non-relativistic particles. So, primordial black holes satisfy the conditions for dark matter. And uh, the second uh, reason is that uh, primordial black holes, since they are formed out of the uh, primordial density perturbations, PBHs can provide a unique probe of small, scale, extremely small-scale primordial perturbations, which. Uh, uh, CMB or large scale structure uh, observations cannot reach. <clears throat> so before uh, going into the main content of my talk, let me briefly explain the uh, formation of uh, primordial black holes. And so far, uh, several distinct uh, formation mechanisms of a primordial black hole have been proposed in the literature. But in this talk, I will focus on uh, particular uh, mechanism, I, in my view, which is the, uh, the most popular uh, mechanism because uh, it can be uh, nicely embedded in, in the framework of uh, cosmic inflation. So this slide shows a space-time diagram where the black curve uh, represents the Hubble horizon. And during inflation, the Hubble horizon is constant. And uh, after inflation, the Hubble uh, horizon increases in proportional to the cosmic time t. And uh, during inflation, the perturbations, because of the uh, rapid e exponential expansion, the, uh, any perturbation mode with a particular co-moving uh, wave, wave number k are stretched to the super Hubble scales. And uh, these, uh, the primordial perturbations are generated upon horizon uh, uh, exit during inflation or uh, Produced on super Hubble scales. Can I continue? Yes. Uh, can you mute the others, please? Now there is some disturbance. Okay. So after inflation, the the uh, Hubble horizon starts to increase, and uh, the the perturbations which were initially on super Hubble scales uh, re-enter the Hubble horizon uh, later in the radiation dominated universe. And uh, okay. And uh, so now let's consider the over dense region which was initially on super Hubble scales. And the rho bar is the average uh, energy density and the theta represents a density contrast. Usually we use a delta to refer to the density contrast but uh, uh, since I'm going to introduce a Dirac delta function later in order to, in order to avoid the uh, confusion uh, uh, throughout my talk, I will use uh, theta to uh, represent a density contrast. And uh, when, the, when this over dense region re-enters the Hubble horizon, the primordial black holes are formed when the self-gravity of the over dense region defeats the radiation pressure. 
I'm considering the radiation dominated universe. So the radiation, uh, so the overdense region is completely dominated by the radiation and the radiation has a strong pressure. And the formation of uh, primordial black holes can happen only when the self gravity defeats the radiation pressure. And uh, by using the simple uh, calculations, we can relate this uh, formation criter criterion in terms of the equations, which is given in the bottom of this slide. So if the density contrast is greater than some threshold value, which is around 0 0.8, precisely speaking, this number depends on the density profile of the uh, overdense region. But uh, in this talk, I will assume that uh, this threshold is, uh, is, is universal for uh, any uh, density profile. OK, so anyway, if the density contrast is greater than threshold value, the primordial black holes are uh, quickly formed right after the, uh, this overdense region re enter the half horizon. And uh, we can use estimates the mass of the resultant black hole by equating the uh, mass to the horizon mass at the time of the formation. So if you want to have the tensor mass of primordial black holes, then such a black holes are formed when the age of the universe is around uh, 0 0.1 millisecond. And uh, we can also relate the PBH mass to the scale, uh, the commoving wave number of the corresponding perturbation. And uh, for the tensor mass of primordial black holes, uh, the commoving uh, wave number is, is about uh, one parsec inverse. <coughs> okay. And the, the point of the one of the uh, one of the interesting uh, characteristics of primordial black holes is that the mass of the primordial black hole can be much lighter than stars or li lighter than the solar mass, which is impossible in the usual astrophysical black holes. And by simply changing the scale, moving the scale of the perturbations, we can uh, realize the much uh, lighter primordial black holes. <clears throat> and uh, as you can clearly see from this uh, equation, the relevant scale for the uh, PBH formation is uh, 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 typically much smaller than the scale of CMB and the large scale structure. <clears throat> okay. And uh, this uh, figure shows the, the most uh, recent upper limits on the PBH abundance from uh, various uh, observations. So depending on the mass of the uh, primordial black holes, the uh, primordial black holes affect the uh, universe or produces uh, various uh, astrophysical effects. For instance, uh, gravitational lensing or the CMB or dynamical friction. And uh, so there are many cosmic observations or astrophysical observations to search for the primordial black holes. And so far we haven't detected uh, any uh, positive signal of the existence of the primordial black hole and the upper limits on various uh, PBH masses have been imposed. And uh, in this figure, y-axis uh, represents the energy fraction of primordial black holes at their formation time, not the present time. The, the energy fraction of primordial black holes when they are formed uh, in the radiation dominated universe. That's the reason why the upper limit is for the dominant uh, range of the PBH mass, the upper limit on beta is much less than unity. And in this plot, a monochromatic mass function is assumed. I mean, the, the, it is assumed that the primordial, all the primordial black holes have the same mass, which is, which is the simplest case and the, easy to cons I, I, the first step to consider. But uh, this is not the realistic uh, situation because in reality, the mass function may be extended or some have, may have some width. But uh, by using uh, this uh, plot for the monochromatic mass function, it is possible to translate this upper limits to the case for the uh, extended mass function. And uh, this uh, conversion, uh, this translation procedure uh, was uh, presented in a uh, recent Carl's paper. <clears throat> okay, so given this... Uh, 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 have, uh, so, uh, Professor Suwama, we have uh, two quick questions. I think uh, you need to use them uh, right now. So Swagat is asking uh, uh, from the slide uh, uh, previously that uh, theta th uh, 0 0.8 isn't it bit high? Are you obtaining it from the numerical analysis? 
and yeah yeah so he's asking about this theta th around 0.8 isn't it bit high or whether you are getting it from the new uh, that depends that also depends on the gauge i'm using the particular gauge so this is a typical value okay and uh, ashley wilkins is asking uh, is there any reason why pbhs cannot be formed in the matter dominated era um what kind of matter dominated era? You, you mean the usual matter dominated era or matter dominated era prior to the radiation dominated era? I mean, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the same question I also have, uh, like it can be formed in the early uh, matter dominations, right? Yeah, 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 it can. Also, Ashley is asking whether it's uh, in the normal case, I mean, the standard case where you have a matter domination after the the, 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 the the transition from the radiation dominated universe to the usual matter dominated universe occur at quite a recent uh, time. So okay. the scale is big. Uh, so um, you, uh, the primordial black holes are not formed in the, uh, in the later time matter dominated universe. Okay. okay, I think it answers your question. So you can carry on. Okay, okay. So, so given this introduction, the, the question I want to address is how do we compute the PBH mass function theoretically given the, for the given uh, primordial density perturbations. And uh, this is indispensable if you want to compare your own theory of inflation with the uh, uh, primordial black hole constraints. If you want to compare with the primordial black hole constraints, you have to, you first need to compute, uh, okay, you first need to compute the perturbations from your action of inflation, and then you have to convert these uh, primordial perturbations into the PBH mass function. And only after that, you can compare with the, uh, your theory with uh, uh, observations. So this is a basic uh, question I want to address in this talk. And the definition of the PBH mass function is given in this equation. So f of, f of m is the mass function and m is uh, a mass. And since, I, uh, since the integral over m gives uh, one, so this is just a normalization, so if I define mass, the mass function in this way, f of m represents the probability of a randomly chosen primordial black hole have a, a mass in the infinitesimal mass field m and uh, m plus dm. And here I use uh, d log m instead of uh, uh, dm just for uh, convenience. There is no deep reason for doing that. And anyway, so this is a definition of the mass function, and I want to compute uh, this quantity. Okay, as I said, so it, suppose that there is an overdense region, initially on super Hubble scales, so air physical size of the overdense region was much greater than the Hubble horizon initially, and suppose that the theta density contrast was greater than theta threshold. Then upon, uh, after right after the overdense region re-enters the Hubble horizon, primordial black hole is formed. And this picture, uh, this is correct. If the, if the uh, overdense region consists of modes having the uh, similar uh, wave length modes. But this picture is not, uh, so we, we, need to, we, we need to be more careful when the overdense region have many modes with a, a dif very different uh, uh, wave numbers. For instance, let's consider the, the, the density profile in the middle. So the smaller scale perturbations are superposed on top of the, this uh, initial, the original overdense region. But uh, as you know, since the smaller scale perturbations re-enter the Hubble horizon earlier than the, the, the bigger scales, so when the the original overdense region is relevant to the PBH formation. The smaller scale perturbations have already diminished, and uh, they should not uh, uh, contribute to the. They should not affect the PBH formation. Or if I const, we, I can also consider the uh, the, the uh, configuration on the right hand uh, uh, right panel. So there are two uh, overdense regions which are separated by super Hubble distances. And uh, when the one of the uh, over, uh, overdense region re-enter the Hubble horizon, the other overdense region is still on the super Hubble distance. So the other uh, 
overdense region should not affect the PBH formation of the, the, uh, the other, uh, the, the opposite, uh, uh, the other uh, overdense region. And so we have to take, so, so that we have to uh, remove uh, these uh, smaller scales or the, this environmental effect to discuss the primordial black hole formation. So here, I, so usually we do the, we achieve this by introducing the window function. So theta of y in this equation represents the original uh, density perturbation. And we introduce the window function, which effectively cuts off the smaller scale and the environmental effect. And the theta r represents the perturbation, which, may, which con contains, uh, which are dominated by the perturbation with the scale r. And the, the, there are, the computation of the PBH mass function is, of course, uh, has been a long topic, and uh, there are many papers computing the PBH mass function. And broadly speaking, there are two approaches to compute the PBH mass function. But as I will explain in the following slides, there remains a conceptually unclear point. So the, let's first focus on the pre schichter like approach. In this approach, we introduce the so-called function beta, which is given by the integral of uh, P of theta r. And uh, here, the P of theta r is a one-point uh, probability distribution of function of theta r. And uh, since the primordial black holes is formed when theta, only when theta r is greater than theta threshold, this, uh, this beta roughly represents a fraction of primordial black holes. And uh, in the literature, the, the we, uh, in the Kim and Lee paper, the beta was interpreted as an energy fraction of primordial black holes with mass greater than m, which is the usual interpretation of the, uh, which is the interpretation of the usual Preschichter formalism. And uh, it is known that uh, this Preschichter approach works well for the, for the computation of the uh, large scale structure. Since the, the and that this works in the large scale structure because uh, all, the all the perturbation modes are sub Hubble scales, and there are no, uh, so all the modes uh, grow with the same growth rate. So, the, so, but in the case of the primordial black holes, the, the, the perturbations with a different R uh, turn into the black hole with a different time because perturbation modes with a different R re-enter the hub horizon uh, at different times. So it, it's not clear how the, this uh, standard approach, standard pressure approach uh, is valid for the case of the, in computing the PBH mass function. And the, another interpretation is to identify the beta, identify beta itself as the uh, uh, mass function which was proposed uh, by Carr about 10 years ago. But uh, it, it, it's not clear why the mass function is just a proportional to uh, beta itself. So these, prescri these prescriptions are not uh, conceptually clear. And the second approach is, uh, is based on the is, uh, peak theory. So this figure shows the density profile in space and uh, the, it is assumed that the primordial black holes are formed at the peak with, which, with a peak amplitude greater than the threshold value. And uh, in A, I don't have the pointer, so it's difficult, it's difficult to point what, where I'm talking about, but, um, but A, the, the peak number density is counted based on theta, not theta r, so in this case, uh, in pre, uh, usually the theta, since uh, this is the original perturbation, this, uh, this theta uh, contains many, uh, contains perturbation modes with uh, different uh, uh, wave numbers. So since it contains many, uh, since it contains a perturbation with a different uh, scales, computation of the mass function is automatically derived because we know the, uh, because it's automatic to know the uh, 
distribution, size, size distribution of the peak. But as I said, uh, the, in this uh, approach, the, the smaller uh, artificial effect caused by the smaller scale perturbations are, are not uh, removed properly. So if you use this approach, you usually have a mass function which tends to have a smaller mass, have many smaller mass primordial black holes. And uh, the another approach is to use uh, theta r instead of r. But uh, in this case, there is no, uh, so far there is no uh, clear uh, argument to relate theta r to the mass function, which is the same issue as in the previous slide. Okay, so this is uh, my explanation about uh, this uh, previous uh, papers. And uh, recently, uh, I and my collaborator uh, proposed a novel way to uh, compute the primordial black hole mass function, which was published in PTEP. So let me explain the basic idea, which is very simple. So the idea is to add one extra condition to the existing uh, ones on the PBH formation. So let me explain by using the, this uh, figure. So suppose an overdense region which collapse, collapses into a primordial black holes. And uh, so this, uh, the, the, please look at the uh, top panel. So this represents the uh, perturbation profile of a uh, profile of theta r. Now let's change r a little bit. So let's change r from r to r plus dr. Then since the change is uh, slight, the dense, this uh, profile changes only slightly. So, so I, I want to say in this slide is that a slight change, even after slightly changing the R, the, the amplitude of the peak is still, is still above a threshold, which, which sounds uh, trivial. And uh, then, so I can write the evolution of uh, the peak amplitude as a function of R. And uh, because of the continuity, the, the, this uh, perturbation at the peak will also, uh, will also give the, this uh, peak in the R space, not the real space. In R space, we will also have a peak. And uh, this, uh, this uh, width of the peak will be narrow because we have, uh, we cut off the large scale effect and the small scale effect. So my message is that uh, my, the basic important observation is that uh, there is a narrow finite range of R where the peak amplitude is greater than the uh, theta threshold. And even, if, even though there is a, a finite range of R where the, the amplitude is greater than the threshold, the outcome is, is that the, this overdense region just forms a single primordial black holes. Based on this observation, we, uh, it, it is physical to identify the scale of the produced PBH at a point where the, uh, the, the point where the peak, uh, the feed R is at the peak in R space. So this is a new condition in the, that enables us to, com to formulate the PBH mass function without introducing the artificial interpretation that existed in the previous literature. So to summarize, the condition for the PBH formation is are given by the this three equation. The first one says that the, it's a peak, both in the real space and the R space. And the, the, this last one is our new ingredient. And the second one is uh, trivial, I explained already. And the third one is that uh, this is a eigenvalue of the second derivative of the profile. So the, uh, this eigenvalue must be negative. And uh, this, is, uh, this must be satisfied for the peak to be maximum. Uh, so Professor um, Suama, you have uh, five more minutes. Five, okay. Uh, okay, so this is a, these are the conditions for the PBH formation, and it is uh, straightforward to, 
translate this condition into the PBH mass function, which is the main result of my uh, work. So if, I, if for given primordial perturbations, the primor, uh, PBH mass function can be, can be in principle computed by using this formula. So here J is the, this uh, uh, Jacobian coming from the, uh, okay, this is a technical point. So I, I will not explain this. And uh, this uh, uh, bracket is the uh, ensemble average over theta. And so the, and the theta is uh, of course a random variable and the P of theta represents a probability uh, functional of theta. And uh, this formula is valid for any statistical pro properties of theta. So even if, uh, even when theta is uh, non-Gaussian, in principle, we can compute the PBH mass function by using uh, this formula. And uh, the, another point is that the effect of the critical crops is included by having uh, uh, our dependence, uh, sorry, theta R dependence on N. Okay. So this is the main result. And the recently, the, in this paper, Tokeshi et al. applied our formalism to compute the PBH mass function for the case, uh, for the case where the part primordial perturbations are Gaussian. And uh, they found that the mass function is, uh, okay, so the mass function is proportional to I of N, where I of N is given by this uh, wrong expression. But the important point is that uh, this exponential factor, which is proportional to N55, and the N, this N55 determines the, uh, dominantly determines the PBH abundance. And uh, in, the, in the standard approach given in the literature, this N55, N55 is given by the one of our uh, variants of the perturbation. But the correction appears that if you, if I, uh, use the new formalism, the correction appears in N55 in the, numer uh, in the denominator. And in this paper, they compare the, this uh, a ratio between new M N55 and the old N55, and they found that the, the, this becomes larger for smaller R and the larger R which implies that the new formulation is, yields narrower PBH mass function than the conventional one. Okay, so let me summarize. So computations of the PBH mass function in the literature have uh, conceptual, conceptual issues, uh, as I explained. And uh, we proposed a new criterion of the PBH mass function, which enabled us to formulate the PBH mass function without uh, introducing the artificial interpretation. And that's all, thank you. Okay, so since we have a uh, few minutes time here, so there are a couple of questions for, uh, for you. One is from uh, Shushmita and then is uh, from Sudipta Das. Both of them are uh, wondering like, uh, how do you, uh, you know, have this black holes and the primordial black holes, how can you distinguish between them? you know, uh, from after detecting the binary black holes uh, by the LIGO and Virgo. So oh. they, they are asking, how do you distinguish between PBH and the standard black holes? Okay, so this is a good question and uh, yeah, diff good question and uh, good question. And uh, okay, so only by looking at the single black hole, since a black hole has only information of mass and uh, angular momentum and uh, the black hole itself does not have any information how it was formed. But the one possible way to distinguish whether the black hole, LIGO black holes are primordial or astrophysical is to look at the high Z events like a redshift 10 or a redshift uh, 50, 100, which is not uh, possible by the current detectors but I expect it to be possible by the future detectors. So if we did primordial black, since primordial black holes are formed in the very, very early universe, the mergers occur, uh, PBH mergers occur even at redshift 100 or even red, redshift uh, 50. At any redshift, the PBH mergers are continuously occurring. 
So mm -hmm. if you detect the mergers at high redshift, that's the smoking gun of the primordial black holes. Okay. So uh, we will take one, uh, you know, we will take one more question and then the rest of the questions we will discuss in the discussion session. So one more question Tanay Ghosh has. Uh, he is asking, uh, can we formulate the Nohe theorem for the PBHS that has uh, survived the Hawking radiation or the Hawking evaporation? Formula. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so he's asking, can we have the Nohe theorem formulated for PBHS which has survived the Hawking evaporation? What do you mean by, you uh, said no hair theorem? Yeah, no hair theorem. No hair theorem applies for any, uh, so if we ignore the quantum effects, the, the no hair theorem applies to any type of black holes. Okay, okay, so uh, let us thank uh, Professor Suwama for his talk and I will ask uh, Professor Suwama to stay back.